see you again. Um, I think I was just with you a little while ago. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I think most of you that I saw then, uh, I'm seeing now some, you did, I didn't run you off completely. <laughs> I hope not at all. But anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed looking at opening the book and seeing what God has to say to us. And the preacher was talking about uh, uh, jumping up and shouting and all that stuff. And I can remember Dr. Harold Sattler, when I was a student at Tabernacle in Greenville, South Carolina, making a statement, he, he said something very similar to that. He said, I don't care how loud you shout and how high you jump, just so you can walk straight sober when you hit the ground and that you have all your tithes paid up. <laughs> he said, I don't want you shouting on credit. <laughs> and I never will forget that. So some people may be shouting on credit. And... Uh, need to kind of catch up on that. And if you've been robbing God, uh, there's a 20% fee that you have to pay when you pay it back if you want to really be scriptural about it. And uh, But anyway, um, how in the world I get in that? <laughs> I look at the board and you seem to be a very generous church and you're giving and support of the things of God. So I commend you for that. And uh, if the Holy Spirit speaks uh, uh, differently to you, perhaps he'll give me the words to say through these lips of clay. Uh, we all stand needy. <laughs> I know I am. I like that big song. It's a little song, maybe to some, but I like it. He's still working on me. <laughs> you, know, you remember that song? Amen. He's still working on me. I want to invite your attention, if I may, please, back to... Uh, to the study on the church. And uh, Christ Jesus said, I will be build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, meaning when he builds something, he builds it right. Amen. <laughs> and uh, we also discerned or studied or learned that he uh, not only builds the church, but he bursts the church. Right. And if he bursts the church, and he builds the church. I, I want to believe that if we do what he says as the architect and gives us the plans uh, intended from this holy book, this Bible, King James Bible. I was telling someone uh, just a moment ago, he made a comment about how people are changing. And I said, and I told him, I'd rather be guilty of standing for, before God defending one book and find there are many books and be defending many books and find there's just one book. Right. And how can two be the same if they're different? For if they're different, they're not the same. So right. I'll be preaching from this old King James Bible, and I have been for over 50 years, and it's my honor. Uh, the local church, we're going to see why do we need the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're reading just a moment in chapter 12, <laughs> we learn that there are three, if you study the scriptures and uh, you focus on uh, what we call in uh, biblical theology, biblical theology and, and biblical theology or theology just by virtue of the way the two words are compounded together, theos, God, and ology, study of. And so theology is a study of God. Right. Theology is a study of God and all that pertains to God. Right. It's not just an isolated study of the name God only, but it means that you study everything that pertains to God. Well, you may ask, where do I learn everything that's pertaining to God? I'm glad you asked. You probably already knew God's Word. Amen. <laughs> because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Right. Now, the old schools, when they were started originally, many of the prestigious Ivy League colleges, by the way, were started as um, theological institutions right. or institutions for studying God. 
And uh, they even have, in some of these uh, prestigious Ivy League schools, they even have some of the remnants of the statues left indicating that. And some have even had the audacity to take it away. And I'm, maybe it's good they have taken it away because they're no longer emphasizing the study of God. And uh, even in, uh, in Christian institutions or universities or college, you may notice something else that becomes a subtle change. Um, it's when they take what used to be the, called the Department of Theology. Now, when we say Department of Department says something. Now, that word was used a lot when we used to say department stores. <laughs> and uh, people understood what it meant, but it meant of coming together of, for the purpose of, the intent of, department of what? Theology. And, uh, and, and that's been dropped in many instances. And substituted for that uh, is the department of religion. Now, there's a great difference in religion and theology. Uh, all religion is not theological, the study of God. And uh, they know it, and uh, we should know it. They don't want to study God, many of them. They don't care who you study, so they just said study the, as the AA would say, study the God of your choosing. <laughs> But we've got to be more specific than that as believers. Right. It's not who I choose that I serve. It's who God says he is. Amen. 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 And that is absolutely cardinal to our faith. And any departure from that is a weakening of the mind or intent of God from our vantage point. Mm -hmm. It doesn't weaken who God is. No man can do that. But it weakens our perception of who He is. We can allow things to do that in and of ourselves. We can allow ourselves to focus more on other things. And that's the reason the Lord said, Have no other gods before me. I'm it. I'm it. And then when we preach and teach uh, theology, the study of God, uh, within the realm of the study of God, there's a, a discipline of study called ecclesiology, ecclesia. That's the way, word way that we get our word church from. Ecclesiology, the study of ecclesia, the study of the church. Amen? Right. And uh, these are words that you may hear and you may have heard. Uh, but when you hear it, uh, there is a study, just like you have homatology, <laughs> Or you have the uh, soteriology, the study of salvation, homotology, the study of sin, anthropology, anthropos, man, ology, study of man, biology, you've heard these words, you go to school, you have it. In other words, you'll, you'll study these different words. And, and this is all can be uh, uh, under the heading of when I'm using those things relating to the teachings of God, they can be under the heading of theology. And under that is what we're looking at now, the study of the church. Why do we need the church? Why do, what is the church? I said this morning in the first hour, it's not just a place only. It's a dedicated, sanctified place. Even the building, by virtue of it being used for the ecclesia, the body of believers, has been sanctified or dedicated. Right, amen. And if it's been sanctified or dedicated, uh, we, we know that the sticks and the stones and the bricks and the mortar and the carpet and whatever is not the church itself. But just like an offering plate, if you will take an offering plate, uh, and then you call it a plate, but you don't put Kentucky Fried Chicken in it, I hope. Right. Now, some of you want to eat chicken any way you can get it, but don't put it in the offering plate because the offering plate, the offering plate, this offering plate is not a container for as much as I love as a good Baptist preacher, fried chicken. <laughs> It is not for fried chicken. It's been sanctified or set apart. Right. Right. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
uh, this pe be beautiful piano here. Do you realize this piano that I'm looking at is not the only one of its kind? Do you realize that some pianos that are made just like this piano, <laughs> piano, <laughs> this piano have made it, have made, some of them have made their way to bars, discos, and maybe, as my daddy used to say, juke joints. <laughs> maybe not quite that prestigious. It might be just a, nowadays a keyboard. And But would you agree with me that a piano just like this, made in fashion just like this, can find itself in one of those places like I just mentioned? Right. But what if, what if a, two or three Bubba's walked in, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? They walk in the doors while we're in the process of worshiping God, and they interrupt us, and they say to us, we have come to borrow your piano. Well, who gave you permission? Nobody. We just need it at, over at one of the discos. How many of you men, if you don't mind me asking you that, how many of you men would stand up right now and say, ain't no Bubba going to get my piano, our piano? Would you stand up, please? Would you stand up? Absolutely. All right, well, stand up then. <laughs> if you ain't going to let no Bubba come in here and get your piano. Yes, sir. Amen. And say, hey, some of you, the truth be known, <laughs> you can back up what you say. You may have something tucked away. <laughs> and I ain't even worried if you don't, because I promise you out of this crowd, there are going to be some pistol-packing mamas here. <laughs> <laughs> So what I'm saying is, ain't nobody going to get your piano. That's right. That's right. Amen? Amen? You may be seated. Amen. But what if the same people, you know why they don't get your piano? It's been sanctified. Right. Sure. Set apart. Right. And some of you are saying right now, and I think out of this crowd it would be consistent what I'm about to say, just as you won't let anybody come and get your piano, because it's been sanctified, and they ain't going to go to no disco or bar room and play the church piano. Right. right. Amen. 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 But I've been in churches before bringing a similar thought to the people's attention, having men stand up and say, yes, I'll be manly enough to say, ain't nobody. And I've even had ladies stand up too, wouldn't they? <laughs> so they ain't going to get our piano. But I questioned them further. I said, okay, you said to me you will not let anybody come and get the church piano and take it to a disco or a bar or a juke joint. <laughs> but would you allow yourself to be taken to such a place? Mm -hmm. Would you allow yourself to go to such a place? Mm -hmm. And you know, I've seen a quietness envelop the place when I'd ask that question because many would take the arms and say, nobody's stealing the church piano and taking it to this Joe. Yeah. But they'll take themselves. Right. Yeah. And that's what's really concerning. You know why that's concerning? Because as part of the church, we're the called out assembly of baptized believers. We're part of the church and God himself, he does not want us to take ourselves to those kind of places. It diminishes the testimony of the true believer. And when I use the word sanctified, it's just like Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be ye not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your minds, where you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we too are to sanctify ourselves. There are three major metaphors used to describe who we are as an assembly. Now I said this building in and of itself is not the church, but it has been sanctified or set apart. Right. 
right. for the church. Right. And for that reason, it's to be respected right. that, that way. If you move yourselves over to a brush harbor, and if that brush harbor has been dedicated to the sanctity and the purpose of the church and for its sacred intent, that brush harbor ought to be just like you're walking on holy ground. And I'm thinking today that so many people, although they make a distinction that the church is not, I mean, the building is not the church as such, but that does not mean that we're not to give honor to the building place where we come sure. respectfully. Right. We are to have high regards Amen. of this place or any place Amen. that you allow to worship God and serve Him. Right. But then even go beyond this, you are not to make a distinction between that which is sacred and that which is secular. You are to be sacred in all your undertakings. Amen. You are to be godly in everything that you do. Sure. So in that spirit, I think I began by saying there's three metaphors used to describe the church. There's the bride. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, you love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for his bride. There are three metaphors used to describe the church. He wants it to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. And if you just read that, it won't have very much significance. Oh, what does he want? A glorious church without spot or wrinkle. What does that mean? Well, in order to get an understanding of what that means, you have to understand something about their culture and uh, their manners, their manners, the way they did things. And if you go back and reach back in time, when that expression was used, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, it was how a father of his Jewish daughter, Jewish maiden, would go out according to their custom and select a husband for his own. Yes, they really did it that way. <laughs> they would select a wife for their son to be the mother of, of uh, his children and also be the grand uh, and be the mother of his grandchildren and so he took a personal interest in trying to pick out the very best person in all manners that he could to be the wife and when he uses this expression, he wants to bring back a maiden to present to his son that is a wife that is without spot or wrinkle. And the word spot it was a, a term that was attributed uh, to a, 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 a sense of being malnourished or a state of being malnourished. And being malnourished, it would cause diseases such as phylagra, which would cause spots in that young daughter to be or that wife to be. When he was looking, he was careful not to find one with spots. And why is that, preacher? Because he wanted to bring back to his son a, per, a young lady that is healthy, that has been properly nourished and taken care of, and certainly not with clear evidence of having spot or indications that she was not taken care of. For he wanted to have strong children and all for his son and his wife, and he also for himself personally wanted to have strong grandchildren. So he didn't want one that was malnourished. But then he also didn't want one that had wrinkles. I hope it's all okay when you get nearly 74 years old like myself for me to have some wrinkles. If not, you just have to put up with it. <laughs> Amen. But when you're looking for a young maiden, just a young girl, you don't want to pick one that has wrinkles. Spot or wrinkle. I see some of you looking at each other, <laughs> sizing each other up. I said when a young girl <laughs> without spot or wrinkle. 
And you know, if you you know why this young girl would have wrinkle, because it was an indication that this young girl is prone to worry. Now, I don't know if you're listening or not, but this is building a case for why he wants a glorious church yeah. without spot or wrinkle. He wants a church that is without spot, meaning he wants the church to be fed consistently and faithfully the Word of God and not be malnourished. Right. Amen. And it frightens me tremendously Absolutely. to think of so many churches out there that gear everything that they do by right. how fast you can, uh, how quick you can run down an aisle or how long you can hang from a chandelier. Listen, I like that kind of style of worship. Right. Amen. But it's got to be more than that. Absolutely, preacher. It's got to be that involving yourselves constantly and consistently in the Word of God, lest you you can become malnourished with all the fluff. Amen. Now, if you got a shout in you and you want to hang from a chandelier legitimately, and it would be uh, prescribed by the Word of God, have at it. Amen. <laughs> but don't counsel your preaching for all of that sure. other stuff. Amen. Yeah. I've, I've had people to say, preacher, it really got on last night. It did. We didn't even have preaching. <laughs> and that kind of frightens me. Yeah, it now, it may be okay every once in a while. But I, I was hearing sure. that it beca has become a, almost an anticipated thing. Boy, we want to have so much singing and all that shouting, praising God, but we want to bypass the preaching. You know what I believe and think in my soul? In order not to be malnourished, you can have all the singing you want. You can praise God all you want. You can let her rip, Taylor Chip. <laughs> right. But when, but when you settle down, yes, sir. that ought to prime the pump Amen. for the preaching of the Word of God. Amen. And when the preacher stands up, there used to be a day that we had great stone preachers in little wooden buildings. But now it seems like we got little wooden preachers in great stone buildings. Right. Give us the man of God that will stand passionately and praise and praise and proclaim the unsearchable riches of Amen. God's Christ. Amen. Amen. Lest you become with spot and wrinkle, malnourished. And then the next part is prone to worry. Mm -hmm. A church ought not to be characterized by a state of worry. Mm -hmm. Whether you realize or not, what you have around here is a faith work. Right, amen. Three banners ought to ra be raised gladly over this church. Amen. Ought to be the banner of hope, Ought to be the banner of love, but they also ought to be the banner of faith. Right. When people ride by this church or come to this church, they ought to see gladly. And they may not see actual banners out there, but in the spirit and the testimony of this church, they ought to know that this church is a is a church that has faith in God. Amen. Amen. And faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes, not only is a banner of faith gladly waving over this church. But there's a banner of hope. Right. In other words, a, 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 a lively hope, yes, sir. as First Peter says. Right. Uh, a lively hope. And to have lively hope, it has to have his life, sure. right. as we spoke of in Sunday school. So the banner of hope ought to gladly wave over this church. Right. And then <clears throat> love, the labor of love. Not just a work of love. You don't say she had work pains. She had labor pains. Right. That's a very intense kind of painful experience involved in the birth of a baby. And that's the word that was chosen. Where there used to be they would sentence a man to hard labor. Mm -hmm. But here is a labor of love. You see it? <laughs> See how the church is working as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle? And so three metaphors used to describe the church, the bride, the building, and the body. And look at the body in verse 12 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body be a member of one body, so also is Christ. 
For by one Spirit, that's capitalized, are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be born or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Capitalize. The Holy Spirit connects us, giving us life. This is the reason the word Spirit is capitalized. Right. It is not our Spirit which governs this church. It's His Spirit. Right. And His Spirit governs this church in, uh, or in, in, in relationship to the Word of God. Right. In other words, we're to be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, we're in success, but be filled with the Spirit. And four things results from it. You have a silent joy, a singing aloud, a spirit of thanksgiving, a submitting to others. And then in Colossians it says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And when you do, you'll have those same four things. A silent joy, a singing aloud, a spirit of thanksgiving, a submitting to others, which impacts and helps you in all your relationships. For a spirit-filled person cannot be spirit-filled if he divorces himself from the Word of God. And so that, for that reason, he says, be filled with spirit, but by letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so for this, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is, is it therefore not of the body? And he's describing the body, the functionality of the body, how different parts of our body carry different significance. Now, if you were told you had to start cutting off one member of your body, you would probably try to think which is a lesser member if you had to do it. And you would probably try to think, yes, that's my lesser member, so whack it off. But you would soon discover what you consider to be a lesser member was also a necessary member. Else God wouldn't have made us that way. So God is trying to instill in our minds and hearts, we may see certain members or elements as seemingly more important, but we're all fitly framed together as one. <laughs> And having many members, that's what he's saying. And then he used a more uh, specific, he's more specified. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? We know the answer to that. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now have God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased Him. Amen. Now if that is true, and I believe it is because it's the Word of God, we have no right or reason to question why God puts us into His body right. the way He sees fit. Amen. Amen. We don't have any reason to have jealousy or any kind of animosity against someone else that we perceive as having some greater gift or benefit than we do. Right. I like the uniqueness of the church. Amen. I like the uniqueness of God's creation. I like even knowing that every snowflake crystallizes different than the snowflake that may rest gently against it. You, they say you can pick up any snowflake that's ever fallen, and they say, in theory, because nobody can really prove it, but they say in theory, as much as it can be determined, there's no two flake, snowflakes alike. I can accept that. Sure. Because I also know there's no two people who are exactly alike. Your DNA code is not his DNA right. code. Your fingerprint is not his fingerprint. And, and as a more ancient form of uh, forensic science in discovering who the criminal might be, they would look for fring fingerprints. Now that's just one of the things that they can contribute to the exposing of the guilty party. They can also use <laughs> DNA. <laughs> They have even been able to go back and recover a part of the DNA sample for someone that had been dead for many years and discover somewhere on that body uh, a tie back to someone else that was guilty in the per 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 perpetuation of their crime. I mean, that's because God made us different. Right. And that same differences transfers into the church. 
and we don't complain about the differences. We capitalize on it. Preacher, it would be your honorable right to recognize that every person here is uniquely different, yes, which is a treasure to your ministry. Amen. You may have a hot shot piano player, thank God for you do, or a hot shot choir director, or a hot shot Sunday school teacher, and I'm sure you probably do in all those regards. But you don't want them all playing the piano, and that's it. <laughs> I mean, that's what it says here. We don't just boast and say, well, <laughs> well, we have a wonderful church because every single person there is the piano player. Man, if that would be a venue for squabble. <laughs> and I can't you imagine that, everybody wanting their turn. That'd be like three preachers standing up outside. Uh, one's talk, talking, <laughs> one's talking, and the other two's waiting their turn. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> He's sitting there right now. He says, I'm glad to have Brother Alderman here, but after that meeting last week and the one last week, I wish he'd hurry up and get out of the way so I can get back up there. <laughs> now, he might not be really thinking out loud that, but he is a preacher, you know. <laughs> he can only contain himself for just a little while. And I feel like my time is rapidly coming to a close <laughs> in that regard. But aren't you glad every, per every cotton-picking person here is not the preacher? <laughs> I mean, any, in, any kind, in any manner, I mean, they could all be the most pronounced, famed preacher that's ever spoken, the Charles Spurgeon variety. But you don't want a church loaded with Charles Spurgeon's only. Right. Do you see my point? Yes, so we got to be reasonable in this regard. But then also I like to think of the connecting, the linking of each individual to someone else. I like to think of us as being links. You've always heard this metaphor. We're links on a chain. Right. right. And you're not any stronger than your... Weakest Say it. Weakest well, you've heard that before, haven't you? That's true. You're no stronger when you're unified and put together as one chain than that weakest link in the chain. And by God's good grace, I don't care what my responsibility job is, I do not want to be the weak link. Amen. That's right. When I know there's enough strength from Almighty God to give me everything that I need Amen. to the fullness. So you're not the person that sings so well that you're prone to envy if you allow your flesh to gravitate in that such a direction. Well, pray God, what are you capable of doing? Magnify that. In other words, you have true value. And you learn what your value is and not just sit aside in weakness, but make yourself just as strong as you possibly can. Amen. In other words, I have a hand, but I have feet. But I don't want my hand to be my eye. Right. And I really don't want my eye to be my hand. I want us to just kind of work together. Right. Amen. That's, that's what he's saying here. Yes. And, and uh, he said, nay, much more. And, and the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor the head to the feet. I have no need of you. In verse 22, nay, much more these those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon those we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered. He's putting the whole body together as it pleases Him, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacketh. And that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Do you see that? Yes. In other words, don't be jealous or, or even be selfish of the gift that you have. But understand that God has given us all abilities. 
And then he even goes on and talks about the different responsibility in the teach and preach and ministry. Verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God has set some of the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, have government, diversity of tongue. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret them? Now he's speaking to his, his people during that transitional time when he's asking those questions. But he said, earnest, but covet earnest the best gift, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So everything that's Christian, called Christian ministry, should absolutely have its tie back to the local church. Sure. Not parachurch, but church. Amen. Sadly, even many established churches and its membership do not have a clear understanding of the way that the church is to function. And it often introduces tradition over truth. Right. And that brings slander to the church so often. As a very young preacher, I rode around with the founding pastor of the church that I was there 27 years. As the founding pastor, Brother Gus Groover was there uh, about three years, less than four years. But he was a tremendous exemplar or example for me. He was a mentor in many ways. He taught me so much while we were riding around in his little red Volkswagen. I probably learned more about the church riding around making visitation with him than I did even in Bible school. How many of you have heard of J. Frank, Frank Norris? He was the pastor of the uh, church in Fort Worth and also in Detroit, Michigan at the same time. Uh, I mean, he pulled it off. <laughs> and uh, had thousands of members. If you hadn't had an opportunity, read uh, a, a, a biography that's written by his Sunday school man, uh, Louis Entzminger. It's tremendous. I, I could read that uh, monthly and still be stirred. I don't think I've ever been more stirred by someone that took a stand like J. Frank Norris did. But then, uh, but anyway, J. Frank Norris in Dallas Fort Worth was the pastor of my pastor, Gus Groover, who went to his school. <laughs> And uh, he was a student at his school. The second pastor I had, Brother Tompkins, was also a student of uh, J. Frank Norris and Louis Sense Minger and their staff. They had that privilege. And so they certainly knew how the church was to operate or conduct itself. But then when we think of the church, here are some things that I've just kind of brought uh, that to your, I'm bringing to your consideration that I could preach a week or a month or a lifetime on either one of them probably, but you have the maturity of being able to sit under a, a, a preaching teacher, a man that has your care and concern, so I won't have to spend volumes of time, and then we can get on to our next lesson tonight. But I want to show you some reasons why the church, just listing them to you uh, for the most part, but show you why why, some reasons why the church was built. And number one, and don't let that frighten you because I'm just about to the end. I know some of you are already tasting that chicken I talked about. <laughs> number one, the church was built with our weakness and wickedness in mind. Did y'all hear that? We are so weak and we really need church. If you lay out or stay out of church, you will even grow weaker. Some are already so weak that they're on spiritual life support. I began to think and ponder that thought a number of years ago. When I was thinking about, I was teaching through Revelation, the seven churches. And I got to the church at Sardis where it began in verse 2 saying, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before me. And when I began to look at that, I began to think about sometimes there are churches that has a name that it liveth, but it's dead. In other words, it's gotten to the place where it's only working <laughs> on those 
things that it had previously done effectively in the past. It has a name that it lives, but it's dead. I remember preaching a sermon to my church. The title of the message was, Wake Up Church or You'll Soon Be Dead. Thou hast a name that thou livest, but are dead. <laughs> Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before me. And I thought about that, thou hast a name that thou livest. <clears throat> and I thought about in nature. It would be like saying, you know what our closest uh, star is to us. It's the sun, 93 million miles away, and <laughs> that's a long ways. But that's nothing compared to the polar star, the next closest uh, in our solar system. You know how far it is? It's not 93 million miles. It's 33 light years away. Say, so, preacher, how much is a light year? Well, they tell me that light travels, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per year, per second, 186,000 miles per second. Now think with me. It takes, I believe, about seven minutes at that speed for the sun to go 93, light to go 93 million miles to where we are. So the light we're seeing from the sun right now started its journey seven minutes ago, approximately. But the polar star, you could walk out on a, a, a lit night when you can see the stars, and you can look at that polar star, and that polar star is 33 light years away, and with it being 33 light years away, traveling 186,000 miles per second, if you want some big numbers, multiply 60 times 186,000, you've got one minute. You take that one minute of that humongous number, y'all know what humongous means, don't you? <laughs> that huge number, right. and then you multiply it one more time by 60. You've got one hour. Right. You're not even getting started, boss man. <laughs> you multiply that by 24 of those hours. That's one day. And then multiply that big, gigantic number. By, if you want to be correct, 365.2. And you've got one singular light year. The polar star, one of our closest stars next to the sun, is 33 of those big numbers. 33 times that. I Meaning it takes, here's what it means. That starlight traveling at the speed of light has taken 33 years to get to where we are. Now you really can understand this if you think in terms of things that you do understand. For example, a lightning bolt strikes. You're so blessed when you don't hear the sound at the same time it strikes. For if you did, you would be on target. If you survived it, you would be very close. You'd say too close for comfort. But when you see a lightning strike, how many has ever done this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have eight, nine, ten. Boom! <laughs> You know why the differential there? Light's almost instantaneous to our perception because it's traveling 186,000 miles per second and the rules don't change just because it's lightning. But that thunder sound, what's it, six, 700 miles an hour? An hour, that's slow comparatively sure. speaking. Yeah. But we can see how the lightning has taken place and then sometimes later, hopefully later, you hear the thunder because it's getting to, it doesn't mean the time you hear the thunder, it just struck, lightning just struck. Not necessarily. It means that it took longer to get to you. 
So with that perception, if you went out and saw that polar star, I'm getting somewhere with this, and you saw the polar star, you say, oh, polar star, you sure are beautiful tonight. <laughs> well, that beauty began 33 years ago that you're admiring. And I thought about that preacher in regards to the church. Thou hast a name that thou livest, but are dead. What if that polar star exploded 32 years ago? You could walk out every night for 32 years that you're able to see it and say, we learned that you have exploded. Polar star, thou hast a name that thou livest, but you're really dead. And that if it happened 32 years ago, you could continue to observe that star that no longer exists for another year. And to me, I equated that to a church as an example. Some seem to be carrying light and giving light even past their lifetime of existence. Thou hast a name that thou livest, but like the polar star, you're dead. But if you're not there yet, strengthen sure. the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy words perfect before me. And so in that regard, as your pastor, he will be constantly observing things or ways that this church can be strengthened. Now let me tell you about that little formula. That's a prescription that's given to us in the Word of God. Sure. Strengthen the things which remain. It works in a church, but it also works in a home. Mm -hmm. If you look at that, you say, well, where's the weakness in my home? How can I make my home stronger? You know, this would do us, bring us much revival if we would, as in our family, you know, there's so many homes today dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. There are people walking around the home that are biologically connected. They at least know that much, but there's no intimacy there. They don't even know who they are, each other, who each other is. And so a home in that case certainly needs to be strengthened by all means. A strong home needs to be strengthened. If I was a coach of a football team, I mean, I don't know a lot about football, as a coach would need to know it. I know how to enjoy a game, just as I've been enjoying just seeing the short version of some of the Braves games. <laughs> Any of you follow them? Not for last 16 to 3. Last night, I think it was 6, maybe to nothing, just a few. I mean, they, but for it to be there, what if you had a weak team? As a coach, if I had a weak team, I would go and look at everything that I could about that team mm -hmm. and, fi and try to determine how to make it stronger. Sure. And certainly in a church, I believe right now, it's just some of the brief conversations we've had, I think the preacher is already thinking, and this, this is a little different message, as you can tell. The preacher is already thinking about some ways that we can be made stronger. Strengthen the things which remain. First of all, you've got to understand that everything or person, thing's not a bad word. Right. Man that finds a wife finds a good thing. Things favor from Lord. So don't you demean, demean yourself by just calling yourself a fine. I'm just an old fine. <laughs> no. Strengthen the things which remain. They strengthen every element aspect of who you are. And constantly as a pastor, take heed and watch over the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseer. With that overseeing spirit, you think of ways pull people together in unison and in your counseling company. How can we make each other and ourselves stronger before God? Strengthen the things which remain. How can we beef up our Sunday school program? There's so many tools out there and people's forfeit throwing away Sunday school. Author W. Flake former still works in building strong Sunday school. And I think he incorporated that in the 1920s. Author Flake 
I designed a whole program based on that and saw our Sunday school take off once again. In other words, Sunday school works if you work it. Amen. That's one of the things. I would look at our music program. I think of ways we could strengthen it. I looked at our educational system. And right now, the church that I pastored 14 years ago is stronger at the school there, is stronger than ever, perhaps, because we took a plan and began developing it, how to strengthen our school. And right now, there's over 200 students there. It's because there was some intensity put in to making it stronger. You can go across the board. You get it, don't you? Sure. From even our conversation. And he'll come and take these things and these things and share with you how to expand yourselves. Oh, I can go on and on about this, but I know where we're at in time. But you think and meditate on these things. You're fitly framed together. You're a church. <laughs> Christ is building, birthing you, building you, and blessing you. And as you do his will, man, you can charge hell. Amen. <laughs> with the strength and determination and power of God himself. Amen. And the throng hosts. Will you stand, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to thank you, first of all, for the honor of being here, preacher. I want to thank you, church members. I want you to regard and take seriously some of the things I said. Put a circle around yourself right now. <laughs> We're talking primarily about church, but I'm talking to you as an individual. How can you make yourself stronger? Daddies, how can you be stronger daddies? Mamas, how can you be stronger mothers? And uh, each person here, if you're working on a job and you have impact by virtue of you being on a job, that says something. Why don't you think of ways to strengthen yourself? Why don't each one of you here challenge yourselves? I want to be a stronger church member. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. I want to be a better son. I want to be a better daughter. I want to take everything out of my life that will be a hindrance to me being better and stronger. Be ye strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abandon the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain that reach down deep inside of yourself and grab hold of something that needs to come to the surface that can be part of your very being. There's no way we'll cover everything that needs to be said about what we're talking. But you probably got enough from your prior teaching and what you have learned on your personal study that you can take what you've been offered this morning and you can run with it. I hope you'll do that, keeping your eyes on Jesus. Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight the sin that does so easily beset us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish for our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and had sat down at the Father's right hand. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you thereby me are defiled. Lest there be a fornicator, a profane person, as Esau, from one morsel of me, sold his birthright. Keep your eyes on the, uh, Jesus. Stay in the race. Forget those things which are behind and press on to the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to do that on purpose. It's not going to happen just casually or carelessly lest you become callous. You got to say, I will serve thee. I will follow, follow, follow you.